Good morning, everyone. Happy May the 24th, 10.30 a.m. Shiloh Community Church service. Just a reminder that following our service is our uh, 12 o'clock WebEx meeting. Hope that as many of you can join that as possible. And this Tuesday at 7 p.m., we will also be meeting on WebEx for a time of prayer, irregardless of if the Bible study comes out on time or not, we will meet for a time of prayer then. So do look forward to that. And I hope that, you know, as we've been doing these uh, online services for a while, I hope that these services brought to you by a virtual uh, medium are able to impact your life in a real way. And I hope they're a blessing to you. But for now, Let us prepare our hearts for worship as uh, Jessica leads us with her beautiful singing and Ruth with her fantastic piano playing.
Our reflection this morning comes from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the 11th chapter and the first verse. I'll be reading in the King James Version. And it came to pass that as he, meaning Jesus, was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Luke 11, verse 1. Lord, teach us to pray. These words are both simple and entirely profound. Prayer is in one sense the most natural and easiest part of being a believer it is something that is merely communicating with our lord but perhaps we should subtract the merely and maybe even take out the communicating and ask ourselves what exactly is prayer and what does it really mean why is it something that needs to be taught and why is it something that the son of god jesus christ who truly of all people has no need to pray, does, and does so well that it convicts those around him that they don't know how to pray. Praying is challenging. It is a difficult thing. It is a complex thing. We'll be going through a series on prayer. But I want us to remember this simple truth. Prayer is something you learn. It is a school of prayer. And there is one teacher, the Master, Jesus Christ. And there is one guidebook, the Bible. There are no substitutes. So as we bring our hearts to the Lord for this time of prayer, let us prepare ourselves to reflect on this simple yet mysterious thing we call prayer. O Lord, our Governor, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. God, our Father, Almighty Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, we thank you for the privilege, for the ability, for the blessing, for the kindness, for the joy to come before you in holy prayer. Impress upon our hearts the holiness, the sacredness, the uniqueness, and the specialness of the simple act, Lord, that we would learn more and more how to pray. Bless your church, Lord, so that we can hear your voice. We ask, Lord, to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen.
It is now time for the sermon portion of our Shiloh Community Church 1030 a.m. service. We'll be in the Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter, the 5th to the 20th verse. So if you have your Bible, you can get that thumb to give it a good old lick in Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 20, and prepare yourself. I'm just going to introduce this topic and what we're going to be doing for the next few weeks, because perhaps it uh, seems in a way to come out of nowhere. Prayer in Luke's gospel is one of the greatest themes that he has. There are many passages and references to prayer in Luke's gospel that are not found in the other gospels. There are interesting little additions that show that Luke is acutely aware of the power of prayer and trying to communicate to us through the Holy Ghost something very special and very important and profound on prayer. So we're going to be going back a bit. As you notice, we've kind of gone back a bit to Luke chapter 1 to see a very special episode of prayer. The prayer in and of itself is a complex thing, as we were saying at the beginning of this service. It is in Luke's gospel alone, where the Lord is asked to teach his apostles how to pray. You see, in the Sermon on the Mount, when we receive the most common form of the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, that is something Jesus simply says. He proclaims it, he announces it, he declares, this is the way to pray. How fitting it is that to be taught how to pray, they must ask the Lord how to pray. They got to pray to learn how to pray, if you think about it. You see, prayer is talking with God, but God is not a man as we are a man. And so as we talk with God, as we approach God, as we communicate with God, it is a little different than perhaps how we're used to communicating with other people. Prayer in many ways was such a veiled experience in the Bible. In the Old Testament, sacrifices were really a form of prayer. They would offer sacrifices for sins and those, the smoke would rise from the altar and ascend to the Lord as a prayer for the forgiveness of sins. In the Holy of Holies, where the presence of God dwelt, it was a place consecrated for prayer. They were to pray towards the temple, which was called the house of prayer. Something that we take for granted as being so simple was enshrined by so many rules, laws, and regulations in the Old Testament. Within the Holy of Holies, there was an altar called the Altar of Incense that had on it fragrant spices that were continually burning all day and all night as a sign of prayer to God Almighty, showing us that we both need to pray continually and constantly without rest, but also that our prayer is pleasing to God. You see, prayer, from our perspective right now, is talking to God. So really, in the Gospels, every single miracle... Every single interaction with Jesus sheds light on our own prayer lives. See, every time they approach Jesus, it is in many ways no different than when you and I approach God asking him to fulfill a need. God is almighty. God is all powerful. God is in all places equally. If we go down to the depths, he is there. If we fly as high and as far away from this earth as we can, he is there. There is nowhere where we can flee from his presence. And so, the lessons we learn in Luke and all the Gospels, when Jesus is walking the earth, are really unveilings of the operation of prayer in the life of the believer. Note that when people come to Jesus to ask for help, they fall on their knees. They fall on their faces. They weep tears with their eyes. These are things that we should consider doing as the need requires 
when we ourselves pray. For though we do not see God, yet he is there. And it was the same for them when they saw Jesus. They saw just a man. Just an ordinary human being because Jesus was born, he grew up, he was, he was a man, but he was God. And they could only see that by faith. So all these gospel interactions shed, life, shed light sorry, on our own lives. And there's much to say, but I'll leave it at that. But what I want to focus on is this learning how to pray. Learning how to pray. See, in Luke chapter 11 when Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray. It is not a random, you know, one-off event. Rather, it is the culmination of many little events, many little emphases, many little moments throughout Luke's gospel that lead to this, this pivotal moment where Jesus discourses on the nature of prayer in Luke 11. We're going to deal with one of the first instances of prayer in, Luke, in Luke's gospel, really the first two, Luke chapter 1, verses 15 to 20, unique, again, to Luke's gospel because of the emphasis he places on the importance of prayer. But I just wanted to open with this to maybe encourage us throughout the week as we read these gospel stories and wonder, oh, how can I apply these to my life? How often is it that we come to Jesus with a question? A theological question, seeking to stump him. Lord, what could you say to this? How could you solve this problem, this genocide in the Old Testament? What, what answer could you have? How are we any different from the Pharisees and the Sadducees who came to tempt Christ into stumbling, thinking they could propound questions that he could not answer? We learn so much simply if we change our perspective to the Bible perspective. That is enough of an introduction. If you have your Bible, go to Luke chapter 1. We'll be on this topic for a while. So i gotta, I got to save what I'm going to say for later dates. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 20. We're going to talk about prayer. And we're specifically going to talk about how to pray. That's our first topic of the day. How to, not of the day, of this series, but I guess also of the day. How is it? That we should pray. What steps should we take when we prepare to pray? There are steps we should take, and this passage illuminates some of those steps for us. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 uh, to 20. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, meaning of the descent of Abiah. And his wife was one of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren. And they both were now well stricken, meaning aged, in years. And it came to pass, verse 8, that while he executed or was performing the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense, which we just mentioned earlier, when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice in his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just 
to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings, these good news, this gospel. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Dumb, of course, meaning mute in this context. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God for his word. There is so much to say on prayer, and more than I myself could say on this topic. Today, I would like to modestly begin our mini-series within Luke's Gospel on prayer by talking about how it is that we should pray. How it is that we should pray. In this passage that we've read, there are three sets of two that inform us about this. There are two groups of people praying in this passage. There are two answers to those two groups praying. And there are two things we notice about the appearance of the angel Gabriel to Zechariah. Let's say that again. There are two groups of people praying in this passage. And there are two answers given to those two groups of people. And there are two things that we notice about the appearance of the angel Gabriel to Zechariah. Right? And they, these will inform prayer for us as a people of God. It will serve as a good starting point, And it is fitting. It is fitting to begin here because Luke really takes us to 11 before he unveils prayer in its fullness. So we're going to work our way up to Luke chapter 11, examining various passages on prayer that we can find in Luke's gospel so that we can appropriately then approach the holiest prayer of all, if, if you can say that about a prayer, the Lord's Prayer in Luke's gospel. That's kind of the long-term plan with this. So who are the two groups of people that are praying? We are told directly that while Zechariah is performing his priestly duty, the people outside are praying. The multitudes outside are praying to the Lord. We are also told secondhand by the angel Gabriel that Zechariah himself has been praying. We are given great detail about Zechariah's situation. We are told he is an old man and he is married to an old woman, Elizabeth. They are both righteous. They are both godly people. And they, in a sense, are going about their godly business on the day to day. They keep the commandments of God. They follow the laws of God. And Zechariah is just doing his priestly duty. It could be a special occasion this time that the angel Gabriel appears to him. It could perhaps be the Day of Atonement when, you know, the people gather together to pray for the forgiveness of sins. Or it could just be any other day because the book of Exodus in chapter 30 verses 7 to 8 tells us that it was the custom for the altar of incense, as I mentioned earlier, to be continually burning with incense. So there was always a priest assigned to care for this altar every day of the year. And Leviticus 16 tells us that there was a special day called the Day of Atonement where they cleaned the altar by consecrating it with the blood of a sacrifice. All right, So it could be an ordinary day or it could be the special day of the atonement. For our purposes, for what we're going to talk about, we don't need to go any further than that. What I want to focus on is Zechariah's prayer request. What is it precisely that Zechariah prayed for? He prayed for a son, we are told. But it would seem, based on Gabriel's response, that he prayed for a godly son. He prayed for a holy son. 
He prayed for a son who would follow the Lord. Zechariah himself was a righteous man. Elizabeth was a righteous woman. In their prayers for a child, they clearly didn't pray just for any ordinary child. They were certainly praying for a child that would follow God. And when it comes to praying for ourselves, you know, we think we pray for something. We think we're doing well. But then God always outdoes us. You see, Zechariah was praying for a boy, it would appear. Maybe he was praying generically for a child. Could have been. But it seems based on the answer to his request in that he got a boy who was strong, the Lord consecrated to God, that Zechariah was praying for a child to be born to him who would maybe continue as a priest in his genealogy. Right? We are told that Zechariah was descended from a family of priests. And he, it seems, wanted a son to follow after his footsteps, to continue what he had inherited. And he got something greater than he could have imagined. He got the one of whom Jesus said is the greatest of those born of woman before the Son of God. John the Baptist has no equal in terms of the Old Testament prophets. And even in the New Testament, we can see he stands alone. Because he is special among all people that have ever lived. Who can say they prepared the way for the ministry of God? Think about that for a moment. Whenever we go and do ministry, whenever we do something for the Lord, we know the Lord has gone before us to help us. We know that God goes with us wherever we go. When we pray, we know that God is asking us to pray and will help us in what we do. John the Baptist went to prepare the way for the Son of God. God called him to help God. Think about that great privilege. And of course, he's not doing it by his own power. But think of the great privilege this man had. And what a great privilege his parents had in this situation. We think of John the Baptist as if he is a random occurrence. Have we ever thought of him as an answer to prayer? Have we ever thought that he was a man built by prayer? Have we ever thought that his holy parents played a role in his holy life? What this passage teaches us is that our prayers can change the lives of people. God encourages us to pray for people. He answers these sorts of prayers. We are to pray for one another. We are to pray for people to be holy, to turn, to face God, to give their lives to God. And this is the kind of prayer God does honor. We need to really consider this, how special this is, that John the Baptist, this great prophet to prepare the way for Jesus, is a result of prayer. He is a result of a couple praying to God. Let me give you the hidden point. What if they had not prayed? What if Zechariah and Elizabeth had not had faith in God? What if they had not trusted in the Lord? What if they had not prayed continually? What if they did not care? What if they never asked? Then the answer is simple. They would not have received. For the angel Gabriel tells them, Because you prayed, therefore, here is your answer. It is a mystery. Life seems to be going on its course. Things are the same day after day. And you wonder, how is it that God could intrude in my life? How is it that God could enter this world which seems so materialistic, so rigorous? You know, I touch this desk, this happens, I mix these two. Everything seems so set and so determined. It seems that if I'm born in the right family, in the right country, with the right economic background, it's going to go well for me. And if I'm born in some poor country, it can't go well for me. The world seems like a closed system where there is no room for the supernatural, for God to do his work. Enter a praying couple, husband and wife united together, praying for a son, a simple and small thing. And how God gave them such a big thing. More than they ever could have asked for. And maybe that sounds fantastic in and of itself. But let us consider something even greater. 
There is a second group of people praying. The people outside. What are they praying for? What is their prayer? Well, they are praying for the nation. They are praying for themselves. They are praying for their sins. They are praying for the Lord. We find in Luke's gospel, two people mentioned specifically who have devoted themselves to this sort of prayer. Simeon, who appears in Luke chapter 2, who is waiting, hungering, longing, praying to God for the healing of the nation of Israel. That God's people would be helped in their time of trouble. That they would be rescued from their distress. We have the widow Anna, who prays all day and night in the temple for God to come and visit his people. Those people are gathered outside while Zechariah is inside praying in faith for God to show up and to interrupt their lives. Enter Jesus. Think about that. Jesus came as a response to prayer. The people were praying. The people were waiting. The people wanted God to show up in their lives. They thought they were praying just to a room, just to a building, just to an empty field, just to nothing. But their prayers brought down the Son of God from heaven in the flesh. Christmas is not an arbitrary event. There was a praying people, a people dedicating themselves to prayer to bring God down to earth. See, that's the purpose of prayer. God is here. God is everywhere. I, we, we get that. But in a very real, a very spiritual, a very mysterious sense, our prayers bring God down to help his people from afar. We remember the Israelites. They were languishing in slavery in Egypt. And what does the word of God say? That their cry reached the ears of the Lord. And so he came down to visit his people, to help them through the prophet Moses, with Moses' right-hand man, Aaron. How is this any different? Where the prayers of the people brought down the right-hand man, John the Baptist, and the greatest prophet who ever walked the earth, the Son of Almighty God. You see, we don't think about it enough. But if you pray for God to enter someone's life, for God to enter your situation, for God to enter your life, for God to help you. That is a request for the almighty God of the universe to enter into this closed equation of this world. This world we think we understand, that we think how he knows, that we think we've grasped, that we figured it out. Prayer is the cry that, Lord, I don't know. I can't figure it out. I need your help. Come down, Lord, and help me in my situation, in my circumstance. Rescue me from my trouble. Do we pray believing that God will come down in the flesh to answer our requests? Do we really believe he is our heavenly father and we are his children? Do we really believe that he is willing and able to help. Do we truly believe that God is on our side? So many Christians, when they pray, they pray as if God is not there. And they pray as if he is impotent or unwilling, unable, not desiring to rescue them in their time of need. The Son of God did not come to earth randomly. He did not come to a people unprepared. He came to a praying people for his own sheep. He came for his children. He came for those he loved who wanted him to come down. If you invite God, he may just show up. And that's why it is so difficult, I think, to pray. Do I really want God to come? Do I really want to give him control of the situation? Do I really want him to interfere in this life I've got going on, this broad way to destruction that I'm living in? Do I really want to be rescued and to have eternal life? So many people are content with emptiness, vanity, and destruction, and death. 
The devil has many friends. He is not alone. And we ourselves are sometimes among them. It's very easy to feel to give up. That's the devil's work. It's very easy to not want to strive to follow God. That is also the devil's work. It's very easy to grow weak. So that even when we're on our knees, we are still giving the devil an opportunity to torment us. So many Christians pray without fully opening their hearts to God. And then they are surprised when they do not have their response. But see, when we pray, we need to be aware that we are approaching God. This is the thing. This is the thing we realize. Zechariah and these people, perhaps they didn't fully grasp what they were doing. Who can? Who can really say they understand what prayer does? It's a mysterious thing. We see the angel Gabriel comes as a response to this prayer, and there is great significance. This is our third set of two. There were two people praying, Zechariah and the people. There were two answers, John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. And there are two things we see from the angel Gabriel. He appeared on the right-hand side of the altar, of incense. He appeared on the right hand side, the Bible says, of the altar of incense. This corresponds to the two groups praying. See, the altar of incense, as we said earlier, represents the prayers of the people. So Gabriel came in response to the prayers of the people. You see, when we pray, we don't see our prayers ascending to God. The altar of incense was inside. It was enclosed. Only the priest could enter. The people were praying outside. They knew the incense was rising, but they couldn't really see it. So it is with our prayer. We do not see it, but God sees it. And that's why Gabriel stood beside there as a sign. God sees the praying Christian. God sees the person who prays in faith. God sees everyone who prays. He sees when you pray before your meal. He sees when you pray before you go to bed. He sees when you pray in the morning. And when we don't pray, he sees the lack of incense. He sees the smoke has dissipated on our altars of prayer. Mm. It's very easy to forget because we cannot see the spiritual reality of our praying. What's really going on? We don't realize what we're doing sometimes when we do it. And so Gabriel comes and he appears beside the altar of incense as a sign. God has heard the prayers of the people and he's sending you Jesus. In response to those prayers, God is coming down to do his work. God answers prayer of the people, plural. When we gather together as a people, when we have a specific request, whatever it is, God hears that. He sees us praying and it ascends to him. And we may pray day and night wondering, when will our answer come? But it will come. But it will come in God's timing. But until God's timing, we must prepare ourselves for the work of prayer. Gabriel comes when Gabriel comes. But when he comes, he comes on the right-hand side of the altar. What is the significance of this? When the priest was consecrated, When he was set apart, when he was made holy, when he was made able to enter into that holy place and see the prayers ascending, there was a special ceremony that took place mentioned in the book of Leviticus in the 8th chapter where blood was put on the right lobe of his ear, the right thumb of his hand, and the right big toe of his right, well, his, his right foot. There was blood put on the right side of his body. In other words... The angel came to the right-hand side of the altar to show to Zechariah that it is only the side covered by the blood. It is only the part covered by the blood that gets to enter the presence of God and hear the prayers. Why is it that the blood of the priest, sorry, the blood is put on the right hand of the priest? Well, right in the Bible, the right-hand side is a reference to power. It's a reference to strength. The majority of the population is right-handed, and not just right-handed, right-footed. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity of, you know, kicking a soccer ball around or or anything like that. If you are a right-handed and a right-footed person, you see this is the side of your power. Our power in prayer, friends, our ability to enter, the side that is consecrated and is holy, 
is the side that is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. When we pray, we have no power in prayer that is not the blood of Jesus. And if we try to enter God's presence without that blood, we're going to get nothing. We're not going to see anything. We're not going to realize what's happening. We'll be left outside, not realizing what is going on. See, Christian, your prayer, no matter how it's done, God hears it. God hears the desperate cry. It says in Psalm 34, 18, that he is near the brokenhearted. God is near those who pray, even if, you know, we're not thinking well, we're not serious. God hears everything that's going on on this green earth. But if we do not enter God's presence covered by the blood of Jesus, thinking about him, devoting ourselves to him, letting him be our power and our strength, aware of him, that prayer will not encourage us. We will not be able to enter in and to see what is really happening. It will be hard to derive comfort and joy. And now we do not live in a time really where, you know, you have the priest covered on the right hand side, anointed as it were with the blood for consecration, for ordination. But the angel Gabriel says something very instructive for us in verse 20, which corresponds to what I've been saying here about this blood, which is that, because of Zechariah's unbelief, therefore he is mute and unable to speak about what he saw. Friends, unbelief, lack of faith, cripples the joy, the life, the everything of the Christian. Unbelief is the great enemy of the soul. It has real consequences. And we cannot pray if we do not believe when we are praying. In Jesus. See, when we approach the Lord in prayer, it is very easy, it is very, very easy to not think that you are a blood bought son of God, that you are a blood bought daughter of God, that God has purchased you, that He has made you His own, that you belong to Him, that something special has happened to you, that you've been born again. You are a new creature, a new creation in God. When we forget those things, when we forget that the only reason we're able to enter in and pray is because of the blood of Jesus, we lose all power, all comfort, and all joy in our praying. It is not because of how good I am that God hears my prayer. It's because of how good Jesus is. Without the blood of Christ, we are nothing. He must sprinkle us. He must anoint us. He must go with us. We cannot go. Friends, when we pray, it is so easy to forget Jesus. That's my closing point. It is so easy to forget Jesus. It's so easy when you pray to not be aware that even to pray is a privilege that was paid for by the death of God. That Jesus was beaten and bruised and took a crown of thorns so that we could enter God's presence in prayer. We don't need no altars. We don't need no holy of holies. We don't need no sacrifices. We don't need all these laws and all these things that the Old Testament people had. Not because those laws have no force, but because Christ has paid the penalty, the wages of the law through his body. He has taken upon himself the consequence of our sin that the law condemns us for. And he has become for us the perpetual offering, the perpetual sacrifice that always makes us holy. All this so you and I could call God our Father and approach him in prayer. There is nothing more spiritual, nothing more special, nothing more sacred, nothing more holy than praying. There is no greater thing you can do this side of eternity. If Jesus died so that you could pray, I think that makes it pretty special and pretty significant. But God is merciful. That's what Jesus shows above all else. God is merciful. Don't be burdened. If we hadn't been conscious of how holy and how amazing prayer was when we were going into it, don't be burdened in thinking that God holds things against us as if he is surprised at the things that we do. 
God loves all the world. God loves every human. The Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the whole world. Then as St. Paul said for us so eloquently, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, for the ungodly. Those who were not worthy. Those who were not righteous. Don't think that. Simply because we don't pray correctly, God does not receive us. But what we should think is what a benefit. What a great benefit it will bring to our prayer life as a whole if we approach it with the right attitude. So here's what we learn from what I've said. I can summarize it for us quickly. We learn from Zechariah that God hears our prayers, our individual prayers. And when he answers us, he answers them in a bigger and better way than we ever could have thought of. This is true of the Lord. And if we don't get it, that's because there's no bigger and better way to do it. There must have been something awry with our request or whatever. But that we'll deal with in more detail later on. The second thing we learn is that community prayer accomplishes much. If two individuals praying brought John the Baptist, then think of the fact that a community praying brought Jesus Christ down. When we pray as a church, as a people of God united together, maybe we don't see what's going on behind the veil, behind the curtain, in the Holy of Holies, in that temple. We don't see what's going on, but it's going on. God is listening, God is hearing, and God is merciful. That's, that's what we learned from the two groups of people praying and the two responses. And what we learned from the angel Gabriel, which perhaps was, I guess, a little bit more uh, muddled, what we learned from the angel Gabriel is that, one, when we approach God's presence, we need to approach covered by the blood of Jesus. And two, we need to realize that though we do not see, God sees. God sees us praying. He's keeping track. He's keeping score. Don't you worry. He sees every tear that falls. He sees even the sparrow. He sees the grass of the field. He sees the flower. Everything in this universe he has made. And he sees. He sees our prayers. But let us never forget what a price Jesus paid for us to be able to enter God's presence and pray. Here's my practical encouragement for us. Prayer is the most effective weapon because it has been directly consecrated by the blood of God. It is accessing God's power through God's merit. There is no equal. There is no substitute. There is no imitation. There is no copying of it. And there is nothing it cannot do. For with God, everything is possible. And I, I say these things, but... I, I myself, maybe I scarcely believe them deep down inside with all my heart. It's such a magnificent, it's such a wonderful thing. It's such a pleasurable thing to pray. Such a joyful thing to pray. Without prayer, I, I couldn't survive. And I know I'm not good at it, but I will keep growing, I'll keep getting better. And friends, that is what God asks of us. Not that, you know, he needs it to hear us but that we need it to hear Him. If we prepare ourselves for prayer, if we approach God cleanly in our hearts, putting evil and wickedness far from us, it helps before praying to set ourselves apart for the task of prayer. As the priests were set apart to enter into God's presence, so we too should set ourselves apart to enter into God's presence. We should stay away from things that distract our minds. Devote ourselves, not just our, our minds, but our ears, our hands and our feet. Be careful what we do, where we go, and what we listen to as we prepare for prayer. Mm -hmm. So I just want to encourage us. Think of what a great thing it is to come before the almighty God of the universe and to pray. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. And oh, what peace we often forfeit. What needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Friend, don't miss out. Don't miss out on the blessings and the benefits of prayer.
Don't not think about it. Don't you dare forget prayer. All the things that God could have done in our life. If only we had eyes to see and ears to hear in faith the size of a mustard seed. He asks so little of us, but it feels like so much. And that's why sometimes we've got to pray to pray. Pray to learn how to pray. Friends, I just encourage you. Whatever it is you're praying for, don't get your answers from me. Don't get your answers from some famous teacher, some book, some this or that. There is one master, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there is one manual, the Word of God. You look in there. You claim those promises. You look in there. You bring it to God, anything you don't understand. He hears you. He sees you. He sees the incense arise from you as you pray. You cannot substitute a personal prayer life with anything else. No sermon's going to do it. No church is going to do it. Only a praying people get the answers from the Lord. Would you receive the benediction? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you, you blessed of the Lord, be blessed in your going out, be blessed in your coming in from now till forevermore, world without end. Amen. I would be remiss at this time to not make a special call. We focused on in our passage how the prayers of the people brought Jesus Christ, brought God, down. All praying does that. God comes down, Psalm 18. He comes down. He bends the heavens. He enters into our world. He interrupts our life. Mm -hmm. And he answers our prayer. He shows up. Sometimes invisibly, but he's there. He shows up. If you need Jesus in your life, if you're praying for someone who needs Jesus in your life, I want you to put your trust not in me, but in the Word of God of God. God hears. God sees. God will answer. You need help? You want to have a vibrant relationship with Jesus? Come to Him. Speak to Him. Pour your heart out to God. He will answer. Always He answers the brokenhearted. May not be what we want. May not be what we hope for. But the answer he gives is the answer we need. And truly, when we appreciate it from the right perspective, it is more than we ever could have hoped for. We'll develop this more as we go on. But take care. And God bless.